This video is brought to you by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever. More on them in a bit. In the 20th century, every sphere of warfare experienced massive evolutions, and in every sphere, one particular combat innovation stood above the rest. Strictly in terms of weaponry, nothing comes close to the atomic bomb. Land warfare got the tank, and air warfare got the airplane, which will narrow down further to the jet-powered airplane. On the high seas, it was the aircraft carrier that took center stage, and as of now, in the early 21st century, the carrier still reigns supreme. If a nation claims to project any meaningful level of power, they've got to be in on the game. As the geopolitical bedrock of the Earth continues to shift and the world's imaginations of tomorrow increasingly emphasize a multipolar world, one East Asian nation is taking a very close look at what it would take to join the Aircraft Claria Club. South Korea has maintained close ties with the United States for the last half century, but faced with the specter of a rising global hegemon, China just next door, South Korea is on the cusp of taking matters into its own hands. The goal is to build South Korea's own aircraft carrier, currently referred to as the CVX. If the nation can succeed, it will come into possession of a powerful weapon of deterrence, one which South Korea's leaders will hope to help preserve their sovereignty for generations to come. Now, there are a few places on Earth where geopolitics is quite as thorny an issue as in South Korea, or where it gets quite so complicated so quickly. Stuck onto the end of a relatively small peninsula, South Korea is still technically at war with North Korea, the only country with which it currently shares a land border. Backing up North Korea is an international monolith, China, quickly trying to establish a place on the world stage and reinforce a regional hegemony. China also quite clearly supports North Korea in its vision for the Korean Peninsula. In response, South Korea has long leveraged the military support and diplomatic partnership of the United States, and in turn, the US has long used South Korea, as well as nearby Japan and Taiwan, to form a sort of political outer wall against China's influence in the Pacific. This is all without getting into any nuance or even touching on the broader regional issue at play, but if we did that, well, we'd be here all day. What we're going to focus on instead is South Korea's long-time desire to become more of a self-sufficient partner within the United States' sphere of influence rather than a protectorate of the U.S. directly. The story of South Korea in the second half of the 20th century was that of an absolutely massive economic boom, one that transformed the nation from an agricultural society in the 1960s to one of the world's largest and most high-tech economies today. During that period of economic revolution, South Korea enjoyed a comfortable enough standing under the United States' hegemony that it could afford to put its military priority second. But that was in a world where Chinese influence did not yet rival that of America, and the Soviet Union's support of North Korea was more about maintaining strategic balance on the Korean Peninsula than posing any existential threat to the South. Now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of new global powers, specifically China, South Korea's calculus has had to change. And unlike in the late 20th century, the country now has the economic power to be able to support major military expansion. The nation's army has always been robust. South Korea requires mandatory service for all of its male citizens, and combined with the presence of U.S. forces, this has been an effective deterrent against any aggression from the North. But if it truly wanted to fend for itself, South Korea would have to hang with other regional powerhouses and be able to project its power beyond simple border defense. And as a small nation squeezed onto the end of a peninsula, the answer is pretty clear. South Korea needed a navy. Hello there, fellow gamers. Are you ready for the ultimate vehicle combat experience? Then look no further than War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. With over 2,000 vehicles to choose from, you can play dynamic combined arms PvP battles on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, or the previous generation of console. Let me tell you, every vehicle is incredibly detailed and modeled down to their individual components, offering a highly immersive combat experience. If you're looking for a fun space action packed match or a more realistic and tactical experience war thunder has you covered either 
way. But what I love most is their in-depth customization system of vehicles. You can apply hundreds of camouflages, place historical markings anywhere on your machines, and even add 3D decorations like bushes and equipment. War Thunder lets you go that deep. Plus, incredible graphics, 4K resolution, amazing sound effects, and beautiful music, which create a fantastic atmosphere. Plus, it has one of the most dynamic and detailed vehicle damage models in gaming with no general hit points. Vehicles suffer actual damage to their components and crew. You get this cool thing called a damage x-ray, which lets you see inside like a missile will strike and inside and you you see it all. It's very cool. There's over a hundred years of vehicle development to choose from, so there's something for every tank lover out there. So what are you waiting for? Register using my link, playwt.link forward slash megaprojects2023, or just click the link in the description below and play War Thunder now. And you'll get a free bonus pack, including multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and much more if you use that link. Like I said, it's in the description below. Join me on the battlefield. And now back to today's video. The United States Navy refers to naval capabilities in three categories. A brown water navy is one that can defend inland rivers and lakes and shallow ocean waters close to the shore. For example, take the Mongolian Navy of the 1990s, which was just seven dudes on a refitted ferry where only one of them knew how to swim. True story. One step above that is a green water navy, which can operate in the seas and gulfs near its home nation, usually equipped with patrol boats or by other relatively small ships. That's what South Korea's navy had been prior to military expansion. But what South Korea had their eye on was a blue water navy, one with major combat vessels and the capability to operate in the open ocean. This would give the country the ability to expand its presence through the seas of East Asia and travel to far-flung destinations like the Indian Ocean and the Straits of Hormuz. A Blue Water Navy could participate in coalition efforts alongside the US, Japan, and South Korea's other allies and protect South Korean economic interests abroad, while making the prospect of an attack on South Korea seem all the more costly from the perspective of North Korea, China, and anyone else who might otherwise decide to start a little bit of trouble. The country announced its desire to pursue a Blue Water Force in 2001, and since then, they've produced and launched several amphibious assault ships carrying helicopters, several guided missile destroyers, several multi-purpose destroyers, several frigates, and a small fleet of submarines. Now, this is a very impressive series of feats, which have come at no small cost to the South Korean taxpayer. But they're not enough. In the intervening time, China has built massive numbers of naval vessels, going from just over 200 ships in 2005 to 350 today. And making matters worse, they've also gotten into the aircraft carrier game. China fields two aircraft carriers right now, the Liaoning and the Shandong, with a third undergoing sea trials in 2023. This isn't just a mildly concerning thing for South Korea, it is a real threat to the nation's sovereignty, especially at a moment when South Korea is in the middle of rising tensions between China and the US. If South Korea's Blue Water Navy was going to mean anything, either as a deterrent or a real way to defend itself, a few destroyers was not going to be enough. South Korea was going to have to get in on the aircraft carrier game. In 2020, the Republic of Korea Navy announced that it was moving away from its LPX program, or Landing Platform Experimental, which had produced South Korea's two Dodco-class amphibious assault ships. These ships are capable of carrying up to 15 helicopters, plus an assault force of several hundred marines and tanks, but they can't carry fixed-wing aircraft. The answer, according to South Korean Ministry of Defense, was the LPX-2, referred to by the Navy as the CVX. According to the Navy, Hyundai Heavy Industries had already secured a contract to design the CVX carrier in accordance with the Navy's wish list for the final product. The carrier they envisioned would be based on the Darko class ship design, but longer and heavier, with a flat landing deck that could carry up to 28 American F 35B fighter aircraft, additional naval helicopters, and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. The CVX was to display somewhere between 30 and 45,000 tons of water, under half of what a U.S. Nimitz-class carrier displaces, and at a length of 263 meters and a width of 47 meters, it was significantly smaller overall as well. The cost would come out to about $2 billion, at least according to initial estimates. 
But making up for its relatively smaller size and carrying capacity was the sheer speed with which the South Korean government wanted to get the ship into the water. As of the Republic of Korea Navy's 2020 announcement, the goal was to complete the basic design of the carrier within three years and carry out the detailed development and construction of the carrier over the next seven years. It was a highly ambitious timeline and one that could put the CBX on the high seas as soon as 2031 with a sea trial period that would then decide when the carrier was ready to begin military operations. For many countries around the world, this pace of development uh, would have been immediately dismissed as a total pipe dream or just otherwise condemned to the same mess of cost overruns and delays that uh, we at Mega Projects have gotten absolutely used to. But South Korea's history of close military and economic cooperation with the United States, the world's leading producer of aircraft carriers, and with many other nations around the world that field their own carriers, gave South Korea a real leg up. In 2021, Hyundai Heavy Industries partnered with Babcock International, a major British defense contractor, to combine technology and design principles in order to build the CBX. Babcock was a natural fit for the project, given that it had designed the UK's Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers and had a long history of working with the South Korean Navy. This partnership also led Hyundai Heavy Industries to put out a bit more information on their carrier design, which had now come to incorporate a ski jump design reminiscent of the Queen Elizabeth-class carriers. The aircraft carrier now showed a twin island design, island referring to the building on top of the carrier's flight deck that's used for air traffic and ship control. The design incorporated two aircraft elevators, plus an auxiliary rear deck built to launch and receive unmanned aircraft and submarines. In this release, Hyundai claimed that the ship would displace 30,000 tons, reaffirming that it would be quite a bit smaller than other aircraft carriers around the world. But Hyundai and Babcock weren't alone in seeking a contract from South Korea. A major industry competitor, Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering, was also in the hunt with a Western design partner of its own. The Daewoo company, known as DSME, announced its own intent to bid for a design contract in collaboration with the Italian shipbuilding company Fincantieri. This was a particularly meaningful choice, as Fincantieri had built a similarly sized aircraft carrier to be the flagship of the Italian Navy. The DSME design was for a flat top carrier with a similar capacity to carry aircraft, but a more streamlined focus on supporting a high rate of fighter takeoff. Hyundai and DSME continued to make their case to the South Korean government for the following year. During that same time, China launched its third aircraft carrier, India put the finishing touches on its first, and Japan was hard at work adding a second carrier to its own fleet. But at home in South Korea, questions began to mount over whether this new aircraft carrier design was really worth investing in. Some critics have questioned whether the carrier is actually a meaningful weapon system in deterring North Korea, which they argue is the threat South Korea needs to continue focusing on rather than China. Others have focused on the idea of maintaining a carrier at all. After all, a single aircraft carrier will have to be out of service intermittently for months at a time in order to perform maintenance and training, so a carrier fleet is really not that massive of a threat unless it includes two or three vessels. That way, one can always be in operation at any given time. Both camps argue that a single aircraft carrier just isn't the best way to spend the five billion-ish dollars that would be needed not just to build the ship, but to purchase its fighter aircraft, UAVs, and helicopters as well. That five billion-ish, over 10% of South Korea's annual military budget, could be better spent elsewhere, modernizing the army, producing missile-launching submarines, and building better air defense systems. In September 2022, newly elected President Yoon suk yeol and his government delivered a piece of bad news. The CBX program was unlikely to survive. In the South Korean government's defense budget for 2023, it allocated a big, fat zero to the CBX program. President Yoon, unlike his predecessor Moon Jae-in, had been downplaying the CBX program since his campaign in order to emphasize greater focus on nuclear first strike and missile interception capabilities against North Korea. Under a political doctrine centered around North Korea, the CVX just wouldn't be a sound investment, and the Yoon government snub in its budget proposal looked as if it would render the CVX carrier dead in the water. As if to offer final confirmation, the Navy dropped its plans to order the carrier version of the F-35 fighter jet and announced that its existing order would be for land-based versions of the plane instead.
But shortly after the CVX carrier was ignored in South Korea's budget proposal, the government made it clear that there was a caveat. In a statement to the National Defense Committee, General Kim seung kyum chairman of South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, clarified that the government wasn't actually against buying an aircraft carrier. Instead, they actually wanted a bigger one than the original CVX design, and they would consider making a purchase if South Korea could develop a carrier-based jet fighter of its own. This was a game-changing announcement, and one that provided a whole lot of clarification on South Korea's broader military goals. Now, we've done a video recently on some of the fifth-generation fighter aircraft designs popping up around the world, so do check that out if you'd like to learn more. But one fighter that that video featured heavily was South Korea's KF-21 fighter, known as the Borame. Planned for introduction in 2026, the Borame is exactly what General Kim seung kyum was referencing in his statement. And in September 2022, just as the CBX budget was slashed, the company making the Borame announced that they'd designed a model for a carrier-based version. Version. Far from giving up on the CBX, the South Korean military had made an appeal for a total inter-service expansion of its capabilities, both in the air and at sea. The description of the naval version of the Borome fighter even offered some additional hints on what a future carrier might look like. The plane featured folded wings and capabilities to participate in both catapult-assisted and short runway takeoff, with the ability to perform arrested recovery landings that helped decelerate the aircraft with specialized runway gear. This suggested several changes to the design of a future carrier, plus the ability to store a higher number of aircraft on board, maybe a lot higher. Now, for the last bit of today's video, we've got to break the fourth wall a little bit and say that, look, at the time of writing this, the latest news on the CVX carrier is a day old. As such, given the latency between the time that these are written and then there's the recording and then there's the publication, it's possible that some of the specifics might be corrected by the time this video goes out. But considering what the announcement is, we feel comfortable bringing you what we've got at this time. So, well, What's going on, I hear you asking? Well, according to South Korea news outlets, SBS News, uh, the South Korean Ministry of Defense is about to launch a feasibility study on the potential of building a 50,000-ton medium-sized aircraft carrier. This follows a report from South Korea's Defense Acquisition Program Administration, DAPA, that producing a naval variant of the KF-21 is perfectly achievable on a timeline of 10 years with an investment of 1.3 billion US dollars. If 10 years seems like a long time, don't be alarmed. After all, it'll take at least that amount of time to design, develop, and construct a larger, modified version of the CVX, and there's nowhere else for a naval version of the Borome to launch from in the meantime. Although it's just a feasibility study, this announcement provides the clearest indicator yet that not only does South Korea intend to produce a carrier, but it plans to do so alongside a cohesive, well-thought-out military doctrine uh, with a cost that folds into the KF-21 program that's already very much underway. Although it's impossible to determine what led the South Korean military to endorse this doctrinal shift, it stands to reason that the lessons learned from the Russian invasion of Ukraine have helped inform South Korea on what it would take to defend itself from major power aggression. Not only that, but with a wide range of experts believing that China is studying the Ukraine conflict as a potential roadmap for its own potential aggression against Taiwan and beyond, South Korea may agree that the writing is on the wall. The first half of the 21st century may well be defined by these sorts of wars, and smaller nations can either prepare for the worst or be caught off guard when the worst takes place. At present, it appears that the South Korean Ministry of Defense is on track to make a decision about the CVX carrier and the naval version of the Borame fighter by the end of the 2023 fiscal year. Hyundai Heavy Industries are still all in on the project if it does take place, and uh, we'd be willing to bet that DSME uh, will still look to submit a design bid. With the CVX and the Borame now going hand in hand, it seems more likely than ever that the carrier will indeed garner the interest of South Korea's leaders. And if it does, then we may well be putting out a second video on the carrier in a few years' time. Whether the CVX does get the green light or stalls again in the face of conflicting geopolitical priorities, we can't say for sure. But what we do know is that as our current multipolar world continues to evolve, more and more countries are being forced to consider the same deadly calculus as South Korea. We bring you this in-depth view of South Korea's carrier today, even though it's still in its early phases, because it's a perfect example of the conversations that have become more and more public across the globe. Regional powers like South Korea and Japan in East Asia, Iran, Turkey, Israel, and Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, Poland, 
and France in Europe, and Nigeria, South Africa, Australia, and Brazil in the Southern Hemisphere have all been faced with the specter of shifting alliances, new challenges to regional authority, and technological advances that might make most of the world's military hardware obsolete. In the face of such change, South Korea isn't the only one trying to figure out how to take its defense into its own hands instead of relying on partnerships with the global power. As more nations endeavor to solve the issue, expect more and more of this sort of video as these nations turn to mega projects of their own.